Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Daily Bread drive through. Lots of good stuff happening. Been on the phone just from the moment I opened my eyes this morning. We've got our big outreach plan for Saturday going in the West Park projects with 1,035 pound boxes of food in a refrigerated truck. Um, so you're looking at what is 35 times 1,000, uh, some 35,000 to 40,000 pounds of food. And we're going to do a fish fry. It's going to look, it's looking like it's going to be like 60 something degrees. So we've been serving West Park projects, which are now the largest housing projects in Philadelphia. Uh, we've been serving there for probably about 18 years. I think it is now. Um, what an honor, you know, um, <clears throat> and we've always, always fried fish. So kind of looking at well what do we just go in and give out the food well we want to help people connect the dots because you have people that don't know the name of the church but they know that we're the fish frying folks that always serve them so uh we just want to go in there give out the uh, food uh and fry some fish maybe we'll even bring a generator out have the music playing but we're gonna it's gonna it's an outreach saturday is an outreach uh that's where we get to work out what god works in us as we sit down and listen to the sermon uh from the pulpit you know daily bread drive through etc so it's all about working out what god deposits and works in us you know, there's two bodies of water in Israel. You have the Dead Sea and you have the Sea of Galilee. Both originate up in the Lebanese area and the top of the snow-capped Mount Hermon as the ice caps melt. You know, you get what becomes the Jordan River. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is actually the richest body of water. I believe it's one of the richest bodies of water on the planet. Why? Because this it's a sea, but it's really a lake. Um, that's why in the scriptures you'll see it called um, the Sea of Tiberias. You'll see it called Lake uh, Gennesaret, or you'll see it called Galilee. It's all the same body of water. In different gospel accounts, it's called different things. Either the Sea of Tiberias, because the city of Tiberias sits on Gal on the Galilee Sea, or a Galilee or K Lake Knesseret. It's a freshwater source of water. It's about seven miles long and about three or four miles wide. The Jordanian Mountains are right on the other side. When the winds come down the Jordanian Mountains, it can make that lake feel like a nasty ocean. That's why the storm hit when Jesus rebuked the uh, wind. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Two bodies of water in Israel, the Sea of Galilee or Lake Gennesaret or the Sea of Tiberias, all the same thing. And then the Dead Sea, both come from the snow-capped mountains of Mount Hermon. Where am I going with this? The Sea of Galilee is one of the richest bodies of water on the planet because while it receives all of that richness coming down the Jordan River, it also has an outlet where it continues to flush out. So it's receiving and it's putting out uh, income out, you know, um, and then it continues down the Jordan River. And then you have the second body of water. The lowest point on planet Earth is the Dead Sea region, where the same water coming from Mount Hermon, coming from the Jordan River, coming from the Sea of Galilee, collects down in the Dead Sea, but there's no outlet to the Dead Sea. It's so salty that no life can live there. Ocean water is about 3.5% salt. The Dead Sea is 35% salt, okay? Uh, it has no outlet, so it just continues collecting salt and has no outlet. It's so salty, so much deposited there, but because there's no outlet, it just collects and sits, and it can't even sustain life anymore. That's two different ways we can live our Christian life. We can live like the Sea of Galilee, um, one of the most bountiful bodies of water on the planet, because as we receive, we also give, right? Or we could live like the Dead Sea, where we just collect theology, collect theology, collect books, collect stuff to read, collect Bible verses to memorize, collect information, collect revelation. But because we're not giving it to a lost and dying world, because there's no output, we just collect it, collect it, collect it. And we're so salty that we can't even sustain any life. That's why no creature, uh, you don't have to worry about being in the Dead Sea and a little fish nibbling at your toes because nothing can live in there. It's too salty. Coming back to this Saturday's outreach, we want to be like the Sea of Galilee. What we receive, we turn around and give out. <clears throat> and I tell you what, when you are living a Sea of Galilee lifestyle, you don't have to worry about burnout. So many believers today get so scared of burnout. Be careful, self-care, you might burn out. I thought Jesus said, you know, he that loses his life for my sake will find it. When you really are operating in that Jordan River in 
out, you know, and resources and, 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 and richness out, you don't have to worry about burnout. What you, what you need to worry about is uh, having too much fun by yourself uh, while others are just watching. That's all you need to really worry about. Because when you're living this thing and when you're really trying to give, no matter how tired you get and how afraid you get at times, and oh my gosh, I think I have a headache and I'm tired and I'm falling asleep at red lights and uh, now I have insomnia. Yo, God will bless you in all of that uh, because you'll actually start looking like Jesus. When he was so tired, he fell asleep on a boat in a storm. Let's, let's imitate Jesus today. So this Saturday's outreach, look, we need people to be there. We have like 17, 20 people who signed up. We need more than that. Men, men, my, my, my guys, we need you there. We're giving out 1000 boxes. Um, and I know men, we love our sisters, right? I'm not trying to, I, I know we got some sisters that are in the gym. I'm not trying to see my sisters carrying 35 pound boxes while I'm frying that fish. You know what I mean? Uh, before you know it, I'm going to hand the fish over and then I'm going to, men, we got to be out there. It's time to do it. You know, um, like I said, maybe um, this is just what you need uh, to get that thing you've been asking God for. Sometimes we pray, pray, Lord, I want to be closer. I want to know you more. Help me not be sucked into the world. Well, boom, here's an outreach. Here's a great opportunity. So we need to pray, but we need to recognize what might be the answer to the prayer right in front of your face. All right. Um, so let's get down to questions, questions, questions. Oh, and I see you guys came out the woodwork with the questions. Uh, Annie Braley, Gunish Cheese, Gunish Cheese, 8 a.m. Angoon, Alaska. God bless you, my sister. Love you, Annie. Eagle Annie. Um, okay. Um, Oh, wow. <clears throat> was it God or was it Satan who told David to take the census? It's always confused me. Okay. Um, basically, that's a great question. That is a great question. Um, so if you go to blueletterbible.org, uh, Travis just asked the golden question. If you go to blueletterbible.org and you just want to know where that's located, right? Type in uh, David and then type in numbered. So it's talking about when David numbered Israel. Now, here's the thing. You're like, wait a minute. Why did David get punished, um, you know, in 2 Samuel 24? Um, why did David get punished for numbering Israel? Because didn't God number Israel in the book of Numbers? Isn't the book of Numbers the third book of the Bible? fourth book of the Bible, isn't the book of Numbers, doesn't it begin with a census? So why would David get punished for numbering Israel in 2 Samuel chapter 24? Well, here's the thing. David, this great anointed king, uh, and we need to beware of believing the press clippings uh, when people are just, you know, just lifting up and glorifying the work we're doing. We could start thinking that it's us and taking it unto ourselves. But God loves us so much. Um, is it that, you know, God, uh, you know, got just uh, unspeakably um, infuriated with David? No. Or was it that God brought this judgment to protect David from what David could have turned into if God didn't bring that judgment. For starters, it's the devil. Um, it is the devil um, who is tempting David to number Israel. Remember, James chapter 1 makes clear, when, you, when anyone is tempted, never, never say God is tempting you. God will test you. You see that in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. God will test you. And the Hebrew word for test is sniff. He will put, he will allow you to go through situations, but a test is designed to bring the best out of you. Okay. Satan does not test. He tempts. God will test you to bring the best out of you. Satan will tempt you to bring the worst out of you. That's why James chapter 1 verse 13 says, whenever you're being tempted, never say it is God tempting you. So yes, David numbers Israel. And why? Because it's kind of like he wants to count how many notches are in his belt. He wants to count how many feathers are in his cap. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, yo, how deep is my squad? Not, yo, how deep is the army of the Most High God? Lord God, this is fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant. This is making me know you more. It's humbling me more before you. No, David's like, yo, we're winning battles. We're catching wreck. We're slaying giants. How deep is my squad? 
And the Lord just comes in with a judgment to really show David that danger. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps. <clears throat> Said I was definitely the devil, and that is Second Samuel, um, chapter twenty-four. Um, yeah, verse two. The king said to Joab, um, "Go through now all the tribes of Israel, from Dan up top down to Beersheba, and number the people, so that I can know the number of the people." See what he said? I want to know. Um, so yeah. So uh, basically, you know, he does repent. Uh, Second Samuel twenty four fourteen. David said unto Gad, uh, "I am in a great strait. Let us now fall into the hand of the Lord, because His mercies are great." Um, so basically, you know, he just leans on God's mercy. He repents, and that's the beautiful thing too. David repents. David is a man we see get tested. David is a man we see get tempted by the devil. But David remains a man after God's own heart because he always repents. He always repents. He always brings his heart and mind back into line with God's heart and mind. The scripture says a righteous man falls seven times and God delivers him, you know? So if you're going to talk about David being tempted by the devil, you need to know 2 Samuel 24 verse 14, where David realizes he's wrong. And he's like, you know, let's, um, let's, let's, let's go on to the Lord because his mercies are great. David just knew that no matter how funky or foul he was, he really believed in the grace of God. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Because Christ paid the price, because God provided a sin substitute, that we can now experience the riches and the blessings because the cursings and the punishments already went on the sin substitute in our place. Um, and the verse I wanted to share uh, would actually be um, Proverbs. You know, Proverbs 24, verse 16, a just man falls seven times and rises up again. A just man will fall. A just man will fall. A just man will fall. And seven in the Bible is the number of completion. A just man will fall completely. He will completely mess up and completely come to an end of himself, but he will rise again. And that is those who believe in the grace of God. It is not that man raising himself. It is that man believing, believing, believing that God's mercies are new every morning. Lamentations 3, 23. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. Um, Hagar and Keturah, were they one and the same, uh, dear Tony Smiley? No, Keturah was Abraham's other wife. Hagar was the handmaiden um, that he acquired when he backslid and went down to Egypt during the famine. Um, he did come back from the backslide. He did come back and build an altar to God in Genesis 12, but it shows that even when we backslide, even though God forgives us, sometimes we still have to deal with the foul fruit from the backsliding. Even though he went to Egypt and backslid, and even though God forgave him and forgiving is forgetting, God throws our sins into the depths of the sea. There still was Hagar that he brought back. He had baggage with him. So yeah, God's mercies are great toward us in our backsliding, but we have to be prepared to deal with the baggage. But even therein, he's so good. He still turns the lemons into lemonade. So Hagar was the handmaiden who he had Ishmael with. Keturah was his other wife um, after after he had you know been with Sarah. So um Let's see. Um, can you teach on speaking in tongues? Some denominations embrace it. Others don't. Um, okay. So tongues, tongues. Look, before we even get into what Paul said, we got to remember that Jesus talked about tongues. Jesus actually talked about it. Um, he said, Mark chapter 16, verse 17. These will be the signs of them that believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. He lists speaking in tongues as one of the signs of them that will believe on his name. Now, what kind of tongues is he talking about? Is he talking about, you know, a literal, another human language? Or is he talking about an unknown language? 
if you read the Bible carefully, it's actually both. First thing we need to make clear is this. Does everyone speak in tongues? No. So any denomination or any practice teaching for people to all come and tarry at the altar and receive the filling of the Holy Spirit and the, it, it's always evidenced by tongues? No. Even in the book of Acts, uh, I, don't, I believe the Samarians never spoke in tongues when they were filled with the Spirit. Paul even says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, do all speak in tongues. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 30. No. Paul spoke in tongues, but he said, do all have that gift? No. So there's two types of tongues. In Acts chapter 2, they actually are speaking in another language. That's why when the religious leaders and the Jews come around, they say, wait, these are unlearned Galileans, and we hear them all speaking in the fluent languages of the world about the glories of God. That means as people were there for Pentecost, when all males had to make the trek to Jerusalem, they came from all of the then known world. Different people watching the Holy Spirit fall on that 120 at Pentecost, they're hearing their language. Yo, I'm hearing him speak in Arabic. Yo, I'm hearing him speak in my language of, of the Persian. I'm hearing him speak in Farsi. You know, so clearly Acts chapter 2, when the church was born, that was, they were speaking in real human languages, okay? However, 1 Corinthians 14 makes clear that there's also a tongues that is a prayer language. And it says in the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 14, verse two, when you're speaking in an unknown tongue, you're speaking to God and not to men. This is not something where a man will understand you. It even says no man understands him. That's a prayer language. So there are both. Um, now you get some that are cessationists. They say, oh, there's no spiritual gifts anymore uh, because we now have the scriptures. We don't need the spiritual gifts. Uh, they're cessationists. They base it on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. It says, love never fails. For whether there be prophecies, they will fail. Whether there be tongues, they will cease. Whether there be knowledge, it will vanish away. Uh, for we know in part, we understand in part, we prophesy in part. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. They say, oh, we now have the perfect Bible. The perfect Bible has come. So now the prophecies and the tongues have passed away. That's not what it's referring to, though. It's referring to the second coming of Christ. When we, when Christ returns, there will be no more need for the gifts to edify the body via the Holy Spirit because we can go right to the king and ask the king right there. No more faith. Big brother Jesus, king, I have a question. We have a question. We need to see what I'm saying. So cessationists, hey, but look, if you love Jesus, look, I... I if you love Jesus, you could say you're a cessationist. If you love Jesus and you're ready to preach the gospel and live and die for him, the gifts are going to operate through you whether you believe in them or not. That's why I don't argue with cessationists anymore. Those are those uh, that believe that the spiritual gifts have ceased. But yeah, that's tongues. Uh, the Bible teaches both. If you want to get a great book on tongues and a, a breakdown in the Greek, it's called Showing the Spirit by D.A. Carson. He is one of the greatest theologians, one of my favorites, and he actually is breaking down the Greek to help you understand that the Bible talks about two types of tongues. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps. Um, <clears throat> Anya, my little sister, my little sister. Genesis 32, when Jacob is wrestling with the angel. Can we wrestle to change God's mind for a blessing? So it's one of my favorite stories. Um, the key in understanding the story when this conniving, humanistic um, Jacob, um, he is nominally a religious person, but as far as his devotional life, he's gone 20 years with no devotional life. He is nominally a religious person. If you asked him, he would tell you Yahweh, the true and living God, was his family. He probably in his house had a sign, as for me and my house, will serve the Lord. But the scriptures just shows he went 20 years with no devotional life. He was addicted to doing things his own way. His family was so dysfunctional. Uh, if you want to be encouraged, if you want to be encouraged, the family through whom the 12 tribes of Israel came and through whom the Messiah came through Judah is probably the most dysfunctional family in all of scripture. 
Jacob has two wives, two concubines. The women are fighting with one another for who can produce more babies to show that Jacob loves them more. One of them is luring him with aphrodisiacs, aka mandrakes. But what God does is God steps in and arranges, permits crises in Jacob's life to bring Jacob to a place where Jacob stops resisting God and starts clinging to God. So what ha the key to the story is, it says in Genesis 32, verse 24, that God wrestled with him. Who initiated it? That's important. Because see, if Jacob is the one initiating the wrestling, then it's like, well, God's up here like this. And Jacob wrestled a reluctant God into finally being a benevolent, okay, Jacob, I'll give you that blessing. Remember, the blessings of God don't come from clenched fists where we have to pry them open. That's what we see in the world, and that's what we get scarred by in the world, myself included. The blessings of God don't come from clenched fists. They come from open hands. So it's not Jacob going to God who has a blessing and a clenched fist and wrestling that out of him. No, no, no. It's God who initiates the wrestling. Genesis 32, verse 24, a man wrestled with Jacob. It is God saying, I want to bless you. You are running from your blessings. I need to show you how weak you are so that your impotence can find refuge in my omnipotence because until then you're going to act like you're omnipotent and that's why your life is a mess, Jacob. So it is God wrestling him down. Um, and then, you know, to show really the sometimes <clears throat> God will allow us to pursue so that we can show the uh, earnestness of our devotion. In verse 26, and this is probably what you're thinking, Anya, and I can understand. In verse 26, um, the angel now says, let me go because the day breaks. And Jacob says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. That shows God initiated it in verse 24 something took place where Jacob now realizes his own weakness. And now Jacob has gone from being a resistor to a clinger. Now God is seeing the earnestness. You see, God is not, when he, when God in the garden says, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? God knew where Adam was. God just wanted Adam to know where Adam was. So he asked the question, when the angel in verse 26 says to Jacob, which is a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Jesus Christ, right? Because at the end, Jacob says, I've seen God face to face, right? When God says to him, let me go, God doesn't need the information. God wants Jacob to hear out of Jacob's own mouth, wow, I really want this blessing of God more than anything else. So no, we don't have to wrestle with God to make him change his mind, but God will wrestle with us so that we'll change our ways and go from resisting him to clinging to him. Let me say that one more time. We don't have to wrestle with God to change his mind, but God initiates the wrestling with us, Genesis 32 verse 24, so that we will change our ways to go from resisting to clinging. Um, and not just clinging, but I won't let you go unless you bless me. I will not let you go. I want a blessing from you more than anything. It's no longer a novelty. It's now a necessity. God engineered that, uh, teaching Jacob what really is necessary. Very few things in life are important, but how important are those very few things? And God teaches us that. Hope that helps. <clears throat> oh, man. Oh, the questions are beautiful. The questions are beautiful. <clears throat> okay, Barbara Brown, why is wisdom personified as the female? Does it represent God? So you're talking about, no doubt, Proverbs um, chapter 3. Um, when it says, you know, no, I'm sorry, Proverbs 1, uh, verse 20, wisdom cries without, she utters her voice in the streets, she cries in the chief places, in the concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city, she says, how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? Um, there, wisdom is personified in the female gender, and there it's just wisdom. It's not representing God right there. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20, it is just wisdom being personified in the female gender, right? Um, now, um, now, contrast that with Proverbs 8 now. In Proverbs 8, basically, it says, does not wisdom cry? Um, 
and understanding put forth her voice. She stands at the top of the high places. Um, and then basically, um, look at verse six. Here, for I will speak of excellent things, Proverbs 8, 6. And the opening of my lips will be right things. My mouth will speak truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. Um, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, verse 12. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Um, and then if you go to basically verse, uh, please follow this here, because that was a great question. Look at verse, Proverbs 8, verse 22. Mysteriously, let's read these verses. They're mysterious, but we understand their fulfillment in Christ. Proverbs 8, verse 22. It says, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning or ever before the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part, nor the dust of the world, uh, when he gave seed to his decree, um, verse 30, uh, then I was by him as one brought up with him. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. So <clears throat> we see wisdom personified in the female gender. Then we see it again personified in the female gender in Proverbs 8. It is not a type of Christ here. It is just wisdom itself, right? Colossians 2.9 does tell us all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. But yes, it's just in the female gender. That's a Hebrew construction. That's how the Holy Spirit ministered it. But it's not to add confusion with wisdom being personified in the female gender. And then Christ, that how can that be a type of Christ? Because Christ being a male. Um, but it is these these awesome set of verses in Proverbs 8, you know, where it's just saying, um, I was set up from the beginning. Now, a Jehovah's Witness will turn you to Proverbs 8, verse 22, and try to say that that is a type of Christ. Um, and that it says, basically, um, I was brought up, um, I was set up from the beginning. Um, they try to use those verses to share that Christ had a beginning and that there was a time when Christ was not and that Christ was brought forth. They'll say that's why Yahweh is capital G God and Jesus is lowercase g, little God. And they try to go to these verses. But it's just wisdom, wisdom being personified in the female gender, wisdom being used by God and all that he did and that the treasures of wisdom are in Christ. But uh, yeah, very interesting. That's a phenomenal, 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 phenomenal question. Wow. <clears throat> um, if God knows the beginning from the end, why be saved? Um, I mean, basically, um, man is walking the earth in a probationary period where we have everything we want, planes, trains, and automobiles, lights, camera, action. Meanwhile, through the noise created by Lucifer and a fallen world system with culture and comforts and pleasures, God is screaming his goodness. Wisdom is crying out. Will you call unto me and look for what really life is all about? And we have a choice of where we want to spend eternity. That way in eternity, in eternity, it will be those who understand God's love and who have responded to God's love and fought the good fight of faith through this earthly pilgrimage pilgrimage, learning nothing of but just the longer you're a Christian, the more you know the only thing good about you is Jesus. The only thing keeping you is Jesus. The only reason you could be a good person on any given day is Jesus, that even though you fail him a million times, he'll never fail you once. And when we finally see him, we cast our crowns at his feet. And that is what God has decreed, that we will rock out into eternity, having left this probationary period called life. And it is nothing but reciprocated, perfect love for all of eternity. <clears throat> so God knows the end from the beginning, but we don't. And we all have to make a choice. And it's interesting how God can be sovereign, knows the end from the beginning, but if a person goes to hell, it's because they chose hell. It's because they rejected his love gift, not because God sent them there. So the Bible teaches both God's sovereignty 
and human responsibility. God is sovereign and knows everything. He knows how the whole story ends. That's why we have peace no matter who's president, no matter what's going on in our land, no matter how many second or third or eighth waves of COVID there are, we know God is sovereign. But at the same time, man is responsible. Remember, Jesus said to them um, when he rode uh, on the donkey, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you under my wings as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. He puts the blame on them. He didn't say, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you, but I didn't draw you uh, and I'm sovereign and I didn't touch your heart to come. So that's why you didn't come. No, he says you didn't want to. God is sovereign and knows all. Man is fully responsible. <clears throat> um, why is God characterized as male? Um, that is a great question. I mean, that is just who God is. It is just simply who he is. Um, remember, God has God has personhood, right? We being made in his image and likeness so that we can understand who God is. Um, God is personhood, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons, one God. God who always has been is just who God is. Uh, I know we live in a day where people just want to even come out with Bibles that have just no genders in them and everything, but God uh, exists uh, in the male, uh, in the masculine, um, in the masculine. So that's just who God is. It's who he's revealed himself unto us. Uh, and then he tells us how the she came along, the wonderful ministry of the she, the purpose of the she, but the distinction, both being made in God's image and likeness. Um, so the Bible gives purpose for the male, purpose for the female, purpose for and very individual, but that's just who God is. And he wants to be known in that way because he wants to be known for who he is. So yeah, um, great question. <clears throat> um, oh man, you, you guys really are not playing today. Does the Ark of the Covenant still exist today or has it been destroyed? <clears throat> Does the Ark of the Covenant exist today or has it been destroyed? Well, as you know, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, we see it in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, right? They're searching for um, the Ark of the Covenant, Raiders of the Lost Ark, actually, right? With Harrison Ford. Um, <clears throat> here's the key thing. Um, when God gives Moses the instructions for building everything, the instructions for building all of the furniture of the tabernacle and all of the tabernacle, um, it's very deep that he basically says to him, I want you to make everything after the heavenly pattern. Um, if you look at Exodus chapter 25, he gives him the detailed um, instructions on how to build the Ark of the Covenant um, you find that in Exodus chapter 25. Um, and he says um, in Exodus 25, verse 40, make everything after the pattern that you were shown in heaven. So the Ark of the Covenant, <clears throat> right? The tabernacle, what Moses built in the wilderness where God came down and dwelt in his Shekinah glory. It was a mirror image of what was in heaven. That's why, you know, you had 12 tribes. Three tribes to the north, three tribes to the east, three tribes to the west, three tribes to the south. Each of the three tribes were characterized by a different flag. This one had the flag of the man. This one had the flag of the eagle. This one over here had the flag of the ox. Uh, this one had the flag, you know, of the lion. Well, that is a picture. And then God's Shekinah glory came in the middle in the tabernacle. Well, that's a picture of Revelation 4, where God sits on the throne and the four cherubim around him cry, holy, 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 one as the face of a lion, one the face of a man, one the face of an eagle, one the face of an ox. Everything Moses made on the earth was a mirror reflection of what he had been shown, a mere earthly temporal reflection, but a reflection nonetheless. Exodus 25, 40, he says, make everything Moses according to what I've shown you in glory. Moses is up there 40 days, 40 nights, no food, no water. He is in glory seeing all of this while standing on the mountaintop alone, right? Where is the Ark of the Covenant today? Well, some will try to say it's in the basement of the Vatican. 
Um, some try to say that the Falashas, the Ethiopian Jews have it. Um, the reality is that in 70 AD, when Titus Vespasian came in and just conquered and destroyed everything, um, that no one knows where the Ark of the Covenant is. Nobody knows where it is. Um, has it been destroyed? Uh, that is a mystery. It actually is a mystery. Um, I think it's even interesting that um, in Revelation, um, that there's a vision, you know, of the temple in heaven, um, and that the Ark of the Covenant is is uh, is visible to John. Um, so if you type in Ark and Covenant um, <clears throat> in blueletterbible.org, um, when you look at uh, Revelation, matter of fact, let me just type in Ark. Um, sometimes it's called the Ark of the Testament. I just find it very interesting that you do see the ark show up in Revelation, uh, but it is the heavenly vision of it. Um, so uh, Revelation eleven nineteen, and the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple, the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So yeah, you see the Ark of the Covenant appear in a heavenly vision in Revelation 11 during the tribulation. But as for the earthly one uh, that was made, um, we don't know where it is. So just wanted to give you guys just a whole um, a whole way to just kind of process all of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, and then why would God have it not discovered? You know, um, because I mean, can you imagine the 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 crazy worship that would surround it if it were discovered now um what if the coming world ruler when the antichrist comes and presents himself as a messiah what if he produces the ark of the covenant i mean we have no idea what's going to happen we have no idea um i will say this last <clears throat> thing in rome you can google this actually in rome there's an arc, um, this, this large arch, actually. It's an arch that you can walk through or even drive through. I believe it's called the Arch of Titus. The, and it's speaking of Titus Vespasian. And I've heard that I think engraved in it are different things that perhaps points at what Titus Vespasian salvaged or ransacked. Some say in the Arch of Titus in Rome, there is a, a carving of the Ark of the Covenant, which is why people say, oh, that means the Ark of the Covenant is in Rome. It's saying that Titus Vespasian did take it in 70 AD, and it's saying that it is in the Vatican basement. Google the Arch of Titus in Rome uh, and just see what you find. Matter of fact, Google the Arch of Titus and Ark of the Covenant and see if that comes up as one of the options. But yeah, we don't know. We don't know. God doesn't want us to know, uh, but the last days are going to be a lot. show a lot of interesting things. What about Noah's Ark? What about this um, mountain in Turkey, Mount Ararat, where the Turkish government won't allow anyone to go, but satellite imagery shows from above that when the snow caps melt back in certain parts of the year, this long barge-like, um, what looks like an ark, a uh, Noah's Ark, is seen protruding from the ice cap during the warmer seasons when it melts. Um, why would God keep that away? Can you imagine what we would do if we all got, what would you do if you had this much of the Ark of uh, Noah? Uh, where would you put it on your mantle? Uh, and how long would it be before you started worshiping it? Meaning, um, uh, goodness, it's like family would get a spanking, kids would get spanked if they touched it. I mean, for you know it, you know what I mean? So there's a reason God keeps this stuff away from us. But what's going to surface in the last days? Noah's Ark, <laughs> you know what I mean? The Ark of the Covenant. We don't know what's going to happen, but remember, all these just point to who Christ is and what Christ has done. When we have Jesus, we have all of that. Jesus is our Ark of the Covenant. That's why, oh, let's keep it moving. That's why, if you remember, the Ark of the Covenant was made in acacia wood, a very dry wood representing Christ's humanity, overlaid with gold, which represented deity, representing Christ also being fully God. Inside of the Ark of the Covenant was the law of Moses, but Jesus says, your law is written on my heart. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was the bowl of manna, uh, but Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And inside the Ark of the Covenant was the, the broken almond branch that miraculously budded, even though it was dead and broken off, representing Christ our resurrection. Lord. So we don't know where it is, but when we got Christ, we have the real Ark of the Covenant um, and the real Shekinah glory. <clears throat> um, um, 
How do you prove to those of the occult that God is not a mother and the Holy Spirit is not a woman? I mean, I don't know which occultic view that is. Um, just remember, anything occultic is going to be in rebellion against the truth of scripture. Uh, the enemy loves to just, just not only work in sensuality whenever he can, but even work in confusion and distortion. So really it's just the source of the scriptures. God is who he says he is. We have one authority on planet earth that tells us who God is. And that is the scripture. It is divinely inspired. It is supernaturally inspired. It is supernatural and it's telling history in advance, supernatural and how God has preserved it. While so many kings and philosophers and despots have vowed to remove it from off the planet. And this is our source to show anyone, whether the occult, whether any other worldview, that God is who he says he is. Um, and basically, um, no, not a mother, Holy Spirit, not a woman. Um, <clears throat> Holy Spirit is God. So hope that helps. Um, can you explain how God simultaneously exists outside of time and within time? Can you explain how God simultaneously exists outside of time and within time? Um, well, look, there's all different views, right? There is, um, you know, atheism, which says that there is no God, right? There is theism, which is what we hold to, um, that God created all and that he is different from what he created um, and that he is actively involved. We are theists, right? Theos in the Greek means God. There's polytheism that says many gods. Uh, clearly, uh, this is not polytheism. It's three persons, but one Godhead, right? Um, Deuteronomy 6, 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Um, but that's why you always see holy, 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 because it's three persons within the Godhead. Um, then there is um, another view. There is, let's find it, let's find it, let's find it. Atheism, pantheism. Pantheism teaches that God is everything. So um, now watch. Theism teaches that God created everything. God is outside of his creation. Remember King Solomon said in 1 Kings 8, even the universe can't contain you. God is outside of time, outside of the universe, outside of everything, right? Um, pantheism, which is what New Agers hold to, says that God is everything. Theism, remember, our view, the biblical view, is that God created everything, but God is not everything. God remains who he is. Destroy heaven, destroy earth, destroy the Milky Way, destroy everything from Mercury to Pluto. God still is God and hasn't diminished in one bit. Pantheism or New Agers say that God is his creation. He is the rock. He is the water. He is everything, right? Um, basically, um, it's not a hand away from the earth. Um, it is uh, in all things, right? Um, and then you have the last um, one, which is um, panentheism. Panentheism basically says um, that God is in everything as a soul is in a body. So we don't agree with pantheism, which says that God is everything, right? That's what the New Agers say. We don't agree, and the Bible does not teach panentheism, that God um, is in everything the way a soul is in a body, right? Um, destroy everything, and God still is God. We believe in theism, where God is the creator and the sustainer of everything. He's holding everything together, you know, but yet still remains who he is uh, apart from his creation, right? But Remember, if I put this book right here on this table, this book exists in four dimensions, right? Length, height, width, and then time, meaning there's a moment of time that this book sat there on the table. Time is a physical property, right? It is a linear physical property. We are in time, right? The past is behind us. The future is ahead of us. God is outside of time, right? But yet, as the sustainer and the one who wants to be actively involved in his creation, unlike what the deist will say, he is outside of time, yet invades time at any moment and at every moment to where even a bird can't fall to the ground without his permission, Matthew chapter 10. Um, so, <clears throat> hope that helps. 
Um, how do we truly walk and live in forgiveness? If I am forgiven, how do I live from there? Um, I think a great, great, great uh, place is this. Um, whom the son is set free is free indeed. John chapter eight, verse 36, right? Um, there's no condemnation for them that are in Christ. Romans 8, 1. Micah 7, 19. He's thrown all of our sins into the depths of the sea, right? Psalms 103. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed our sins from us. You can go east forever. You can go west forever. He's put an infinite distance between us and our sin. Uh, and the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Now, having said that, how are we supposed to live? Because we can't pay him back, right? We can, it's, it's a gift. Paul calls it his unspeakable gift in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, um, ba, 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 2 Corinthians 9, verse 15. It's an unspeakable gift. No one could have invented it. It's unbelievable. It's crazy. And that's what leads you to say, like Psalms 116, verse uh, 12. How can I pay God back for all of his benefits toward me? We can't. All we can do is share the good news. And even though we can't pay him back, we do realize that we owe him our life because he bought our life with his blood, 1 Corinthians 6.20. And now we are debtors. But debtor, not meaning that we have to pay him back because we can't, but we say that we are now debtors. We owe it to him to live after him. We owe it to him to obey him. We owe it to him to seek him. Romans chapter 8 um, and verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we're debtors not to live after the flesh. Um, for you, if you live after the flesh, you will die. But if you through the Holy Spirit kill the deeds of the body, you will live. So we are now debtors. Uh, to follow him. We're debtors to to chase him down. We're debtors. We we owe him our life. Um, that's why I love Psalms 116 verse 12. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits toward me? How can I pay him back? I can't, but I will tell you what I will do. Verse 13, I will take the cup of salvation. I, I can't pay him back, but I will take the cup. I will celebrate this salvation. I will. I can't pay him back, but I will wake up every day and drink that cup and celebrate that he drank the cup of wrath and I will drink the cup every day. It doesn't mean I get saved every day. It means every day I am rehearsing how I guzzled down that sweet blood of his New Testament to the very last drop. Boom. Let's go to the next question someone asked yesterday. What did Jesus mean then? When he said in John chapter six, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. What? Jesus said to them in John six, verse 53, if you don't eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Verse 54, for whoever eats my flesh and whoever drinks my blood has eternal life because my flesh is meat and my blood is drink. Um, what is he referring to there? Well, basically, when he said that, um, it says that people began murmuring um, and basically didn't walk with him anymore after that. Um, they started walking away uh, when he said that. Um, what does he mean by that? What does he mean? <clears throat> We're talking about drinking the cup of salvation. Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 54, uh, if you don't eat my flesh and you don't drink my blood, you don't have life. What he's saying is this. When I eat something, you guys, I ingest it, I digest it, I assimilate it. It fills my entire body, right? Um, it doesn't just go in my brain and sit there as information. Uh, it doesn't just stay on the edge of my ear as something to think upon when I'm bored. No, when I receive Christ as Lord and Savior, he's saying, I'm not just here to be theological concepts. I'm not just here for you to say, preach, preacher, man. Mm, mm, truth, truth. Oh, man, that's that truth right there. No, he's saying more than that, because you can believe that the gospel is truth, believe in the work of Christ, that it is the only way to be saved and still die in your sins. You can sit right in front of a loaf of bread and believe that it can sustain you believe that it has everything that it has on the label and sit right in front of it and actually starve to death. Jesus wanted people to beware of easy believism. The last thing Jesus wants is someone following him around thinking they have eternal life when they don't. Easy believism, right? Um, so he said, yo, just like you ingest food, 
digest food and it assimilates and that what you have eaten from that meal goes to all of the cells of your body, you've got to receive me as Lord and Savior. You have got to truly welcome me into your heart where you have ingested this truth, digested this truth, and I have filled your being, which means you've truly repented and truly invited me in, not just allowed me into your brain uh, as a factual spiritual phenomenon. And yeah, a lot of people walked away when he said that because Jesus would rather them walk away and at least know that they are have not responded um, to the reality uh, than follow him along and just be deceived into thinking they really believed when they when they didn't, that they really had eternal life when they didn't. Jesus is going against easy believism there because he's not willing that any should perish. He wants people to really know, really know whether they're saved or not. And the Bible lets us know. So uh, let's see. Um, what do people do once we bring them to Christ? What's next? Things don't change overnight. No, things don't change overnight when you give your life to the Lord. Uh, we all wish it did. But basically, when someone gives their life to the Lord, they are a baby, right? That's why, well, what do you do when a baby is born? You gotta feed that baby. You don't feed that baby, that baby's gonna be in a really bad place, right? So it says in 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word so you can grow. And just like a baby, once you're on milk, then you start moving on to solid foods and meat. You start people on just the milk of the reality of what does it mean to be a Christian? What did Jesus do for you? What does God's love look like? What is the beauty of John 3, 16, the good news of the gospel? What does it mean for shame? What does it mean for guilt? What does it mean for condemnation? What does it mean for the lies of the devil? How do we take old thoughts captive and bring them to obedience and have our mind renewed to start thinking like a believer? Romans 12, 2, that's where you start. Um, and basically the flesh, the spirit, you know, uh, all of that. And then you work your way up to meat. So basically you just start, you know, you got, you got to eat every day. You got to read the word. You got to eat every day. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. You got to grow in your faith. Uh, Romans 10, 10, 17. Um, so let's see. Um, Tamara in Genesis three fifteen, who is God referring to as the devil's offspring is it the other fallen angels? Jersey City in the building tomorrow was good. All right. Um, now, I suddenly have a taste for White Castle, which is the staple. Every Jersey kid raised on White Castle, no doubt. Um, basically, this is the first promise of the Messiah. Adam and Eve have just messed up. God could have just turned out the lights. Click. I told you not to eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I gave you paradise. I gave you paradise and I loved you. I walked Eve up the aisle and gave her to the man. I performed the wedding ceremony. You had everything. And if you wanted more, all you had to do was ask me. But instead you listened to a devil, a lying devil and didn't even run to me as refuge. Good night. Click. He could have done that. But here's the thing. God knew that man would already fall. Didn't make him fall, but knew he would fall. That's why it says in Revelation 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before God even said, let there be light, he already knew that his creation, when given free will, would rebel against him. And it was already decided that Jesus, the second person of the triune Godhead, would inject himself into his own vile creation, uh, put on human flesh to die as our sin substitute. Genesis 3.15, instead of turning out the lights on Adam and Eve, he gives them good news. And the good news is that a Messiah is coming. And he says it's going to come from the seed of the woman. That speaks of the virgin birth because a, everyone knows a woman doesn't have a seed. A woman has an egg. But for a woman to have a seed is a biological impossibility. He's speaking of the Isaiah 7, 14, virgin birth all the way in the Garden of Eden. But he says, I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. <clears throat> the seed of the serpent represents... Um, the clash that goes on through the ages of those that give their life to God, want to walk with God, want, oh yeah, life makes sense with God. And then those that say, forget that, Satan rebelled, Adam and Eve rebelled, 
I rebel. Matter of fact, is God even there and walk in that darkness? And there will always be an enmity, a tension between those that want to follow the ways of God and those that want to follow the ways of the devil. Um, I mean, you even see that when Jesus came down, uh, he came down as the seed of the woman. And there was the seed of the serpent in the Pharisees, in the religious mafia right there. And you saw the beef, uh, which worked out to Jesus being crucified, but it was all God's plan anyway. So the seed of the serpent. Cain would represent the seed of the serpent. Haman, when trying to destroy the Jews in the days of Queen Esther, would represent the seed of the serpent. Um, when you saw even it says that Samuel, the prophet's own sons, were sons of Belial. Yo, be encouraged, any of you who have prodigals, even Samuel, one of the greatest prophets in the Bible, it says his sons were devil worshipers. Yo, even the greatest people who love their Lord sometimes have kids that not only rebel, not only backslide, but the Bible calls them sons of the devil. So yeah, this seed of the serpent, you see it manifesting and that's the tension uh, that we see even right now. But we preach the gospel because we get to see seeds of the serpent become, you know, the seed of, uh, of, 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 of God, become children of God. I once walked as a seed of the serpent. You once walked as a seed of the serpent, but we got converted, right? Wolves being made into sheep, right? So I uh, hope that helps. Um, let's see. Um, Elizabeth, God bless you. It looks like you did a little research. You said something depicts the Ark of the Covenant being carried out in the looting. Yeah, like I said, a lot of surprises of where that Ark of the Covenant could be and how might it pop up in the end days, especially as a temple is being built in Jerusalem. There's going to be another temple built because the Bible makes clear that the Antichrist is going to walk into that temple and present himself. Do you know, as we speak, they're checking for who the Levites are in Israel. They're looking up DNA records. They're getting Levites to do the building. They're working on that temple. Who knows if this Ark of the Covenant might pop up? Can you imagine how much the Jewish people would embrace the Antichrist if he came on the scene and actually brought forth the Ark of the Covenant? Anyway, deep stuff, deep stuff. Um, so let's see, Dwayne, what's going on, my brother? God bless you. Um, can you explain the futurist view, Sandra Graham? Look at you, Sandra. You don't play. You're not playing around. You didn't come to play today. Um, Sandra Graham asks, can you explain the futurist view? There's two views, um, of the book of Revelation, right? Um, some have, there are at least two views, uh, but there's only one view that I believe is right. Some say the book of Revelation is really written in code to talk about what Christians were going through in the first hundred years of the church under Nero, who was the beast. Uh, and it was giving them a coded book to navigate a time when Christians were being dipped in tar, set on fire in Nero's rose garden. He would ride through the chariot, history tells us, and laugh and say, oh, you're the light of the world because you're now lighting up my garden. Um, some say that Revelation was written just for Christians during those hundred years, talking about Caesar Nero is the beast and helping them navigate through it and giving them hope. And that it has no bearing on today other than just to remind us that God's always in control. That's a preterist view. We have a futurist view. We believe Revelation has not unraveled yet. We believe it is yet future. We believe it is chronological. And we base that view on Matthew 24. They said to Jesus, what will be the signs of your coming? What are the signs of the future? If you take Jesus's revealings of his signs in Matthew 24 and you line it up with the book of Revelation, it's to the T describing what will happen before he returns and everything else. So uh, we have a futurist view, meaning it has not yet happened. So, um, so yeah. Oh yeah, no doubt. The third temple, no, no doubt. They're even looking for the red heifer in Israel. Remember, you needed the ashes of a red heifer um, for the purification, um, for the handling of the instruments and the dealing in the temple. Um, so they are looking for this red heifer to be born in Israel as we speak. You read about the red heifer in Numbers 19. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on right now. Um, so let's see if there's any other questions um, boom, time flies when you're having fun. That's one hour. Um, yo, we're having a good time. Remember, 
Monday starts season five. We're going to get in the book of Revelation. The graphic should be ready tomorrow. Tiara is working on it. We're going to have a new graphic. We need y'all to pump it. Believers got to know their Bible. And here's the thing. This is what I'm going to do. As for me and my house, I'm telling my family, you guys got to know Revelation. If you don't want to know any other book, uh, if you just want to enjoy just kind of dibbling and dabbling and take, no, no, no. We're going to know Revelation uh, where my goal is that everyone in my house will be able to reference it, mark it, and teach it. So I'm trying to get my whole house on board for following Revelation verse by verse. You should do the same. When we get the graphic, put it out there. Do you know how many believers there are who are part of churches where God has placed them, churches doing amazing things, uh, but the church just doesn't teach verse by verse and the church is not teaching revelation. Do you know how many believers want to know it? Look, we're, we're all one body. We need to get this word out so that as many people as possible can know revelation because it's given to give you peace in the midst of life as earth is coming apart at the seams. Everyone needs revelation, and then we're all one body. So let's get ready to even share that graphic and get people on board. Um, so let's see what else. Um, any other questions? Um, can you talk about union with Christ, Jared Dempsey? You pen represent represent. Can you talk about union with Christ? Is it primarily our sin or the sin of Adam that makes us sinners? Um, is it our sin or the sin of Adam that makes us sinners? Well, remember David said in Psalm 51, I was born in iniquity. I was born crooked. Uh, I was born, iniquity means that you are just morally twisted all up within, tore up from the floor up. So because of Adam's sin, we are born as sinners, uh, but then we actually sin, which makes us sinners. So it's really both. We're born as sinners and, and which makes us sinners, and then we sin, which makes us sinners. Um, so yes, even before that baby out of the womb is cute and adorable and in God's image and likeness, still in the Imago Dei, uh, even in a fallen place, that baby is a sinner. Uh, but then the baby just sins to show that it's a sinner. Just like an apple tree produces apples just to show that it's an apple tree, you know? An apple tree does not produce apples so that it can become an apple tree. An apple tree produces apples because it already is an apple tree. We sin. Uh, we don't sin so that we could become sinners. We sin because we already are born as sinners. So praise God. Romans 5 will really break that down where it just gets into um, from one man's offense, death has come. You know, from the offense of all, judgment came. Uh, from one man's, Romans 5 19, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, Jesus, shall many be made righteous. So, yeah, it's because of Adam's sin, we're sinners. And then we sin, which confirms that we're sinners. So really both. But um, if you want to put the horse before the cart, it's Adam's sin. Um, so uh, Psalm 22 is beautiful. Yes, Rasmaya, God bless you, little sister. Psalms 22 is absolutely beautiful. Um, and actually prophesies about the crucifixion uh, when crucifixion was not even invented yet. When King David writes, they pierced my hands and my feet in Psalm 22, crucifixion was not even invented as a way to execute someone. The Israelites would stone you. He's writing about crucifixion was when it wasn't even invented. That's Psalm 22, verse 16. He says, they part all my gardens, they part my garments and they cast lots for my vesture. That was fulfilled when they all took Jesus's. Remember, the average Jewish man wore five pieces of clothing, right? He had sandals. He had the outward cloak. You know, he had uh, the uh, other piece. There was four articles of clothing that an average person wore in daily life, right? But the fifth article of clothing was actually like this seamless tunic or a seamless tunic you would wear underneath everything. Remember, there were four Roman soldiers at the foot of the cross. They each took a garment, kind of like a trophy, uh, the way someone keeps a deer head after they shoot a deer they would keep a trophy from the crucifixion but remember there was a fifth garment the seamless tunic and the roman soldiers are like yo it's four of us but there's a fifth garment how do we solve this let's gamble for it so here they are at the foot of the cross casting lots aka rolling dice aka gambling for it but look at how david prophesied of this all the way in psalm 22 verse 18 oh man 
So um, why didn't God stop Jephthah from sacrificing his daughter to <laughs> coming in? Look, it's 104. Let's come in tomorrow. Let's do it. Um, let's do it. Let's see. Um, yeah, animal sacrifices. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, wow. Um, uh, if Adam and Eve didn't sin, would there still be sin or would someone else mess up down the line? Um, if Adam and Eve did not sin, would someone else mess up down the line? Most definitely. Um, and matter of fact, just to see, you know, what man will do when given free will, it's just like Adam and Eve would do it. Uh, how many of us, instead of, and here's the answer, Ebony, how many times in our own lives, instead of thanking God for everything we have, have always had our bottom lip out and uh, our arms folded and an attitude over the one thing we couldn't have? So you understand why they did that in the garden with the one tree, even after having everything else uh, and how, you know, they did it. We would have done it. So, yeah, people say, oh, if I was there, that's not fair. If I was there, I wouldn't have fallen. It's like, yeah, right. Um, so, look, that's it for today. We'll come in tomorrow. We'll talk about Jephthah. Let's keep it moving, you guys. God bless you. But look. We need some people to be ready for this outreach on Saturday. We need you guys. If you're from out of town, maybe you're part of the Antioch family, even though you serve at another church, uh, but you're with us at Daily Bread drive Through. Look, if you want to come out Saturday, email us, info at antiochphilly.org. Uh, we're, we're showing the world that we're all one body. So uh, we need people to be there. You know, we need people to be there. So please, let's even consider fasting and praying tomorrow uh, or tomorrow or Friday. Let's go out Saturday. Let's preach the gospel. Let's bless the hungry folk. Let's most of all serve Jesus and serve the people that he died for. All right. So look, see you tomorrow. And um, that's it. Salute, salute, salute. God bless you. Love you. Let's keep it moving.